Welcome to Marketplace Tech Bytes, our weekly review of the biggest stories making headlines across the industry. I'm your host, Lily Dramali. This week on the show, world leaders grapple with AI in Davos. The FDA expands its approvals for CRISPR gene editing therapies. And we ask, is bad marketing stunting health tech companies? Joining me this week is Chrissy Farr. She's a health tech investor at Omer's Ventures. Welcome to you, Chrissy. Thank you so much for having me, Lily. It's really great to have you. And we are going to start, as we always do, with our bite of the week. This is one number that sums up the big story in tech. Chrissy, what do you have for us? So my number is 30% because just last week, Reuters put out a story, this is on Jan 11th, showing that in 2023, startup funding was actually down 30% from the prior year, 2022. Um, and it's still a lot of money that went in. It was $170.6 billion that went into startups in 2023, but um, very much down. And that is despite all the frenzy about AI. Um, the market's just not, not performing all that well. And we haven't seen the bounce back that we thought we might. Yeah. And the talk of the town uh, on AI in Davos this week seems to be, how do we make money off of this? Because there are so many demos out there. Not everything is proving to be the next chat GPT, as it turns out. Um, so, Chrissy, do you get the sense that they're getting any closer to figuring out the answer to that question? Yeah, I mean, just from my own seat as a healthcare investor, every company seems to be an AI company these days, even if, you know, a year ago they were a services company or doing doing something else entirely. So it seems like we just want to sprinkle some AI pixie dust and then say, you know, this is a big business opportunity that's worth far more than it than it was previously. But I think you're right. We don't have a business model yet. And no one knows, is this a space that a startup can even win? Maybe this is just something that the incumbents will ultimately win. I don't discount companies like Microsoft. I don't discount companies like Google. Um, these, are, these are businesses that have hundreds of engineers working on AI specifically. So how do you compete if you're a tiny company with maybe one or two engineers? I think all of these questions are still, are still really being asked. And, and that was a big topic of, of uh, Davos. Yeah, this is interesting too. Boston Consulting Group surveyed more than a thousand C-suite executives and 90% of them said they are waiting for generative AI to take a step beyond the recent hype. They are using it, if at all, in pilots or in, in other pretty limited ways. Um, are you surprised by that, that businesses are almost having to be courted to integrate AI into what they do? I think it's still unclear what the real use cases for AI will be. There's been a lot of talk of potentially using AI to summarize conversations that people are having so that we don't need to be taking as many notes. And I think that's an interesting opportunity. A lot of it um, now you see kind of use cases around customer service and just anything that's really customer facing. And I think um, there's a really good reason why many companies are sort of approaching that somewhat hesitantly. Because, you know, think about the last time we called customer service, you're like frantically hitting zero, like, can I please talk to a human being? And I think the <laughs> idea of just now, now we've flipped this over to an AI isn't necessarily kind of the right immediate step. And we have a lot to think through, not to mention, you know, the potential for inaccuracy, the potential for fabrications. There are so many things about this evolving software that we we still don't totally understand. So I think I think it's right that we are doing this with some caution before we kind of just plow right into it. And what are your thoughts on AI's potential in health tech, since that is your investment focus? You mentioned note taking. You know, people might be okay with uh, doctor's notes, getting some help from an AI. Maybe they're less okay, for example, with getting a diagnosis that was facilitated with an AI. Um, is there more or less resistance to generative artificial intelligence in healthcare compared to other sectors from what you've seen? I think a lot of openness actually in healthcare, um, more so than than you would expect from the physician community because of what we call pajama time, which is this time at the end of the day after they've been practicing for hours that they have to just summarize notes, as you said. And so mm -hmm. the potential for AI to do that, I think, is really strong. And we've seen some exciting companies that, you know, frankly, I've been quite flawed just um, looking at these demos. 
where we're just sitting having a, an interaction and they're just looking, you know, the physicians actually like not on a laptop, they're out just looking me straight in the eye, really paying attention. And they just know that the system on the back end is capturing everything and putting it into uh, a really good clinical summary. Um, and they, you know, I think it's just the potential there is just immediate and strong. The need is there. Like I've got a lot of, uh, I'm bullish. On the, on the diagnosis front, I think you raise a really good point that it's um, it's less clear. What's been interesting is just looking on Twitter, how many people have said, I've been using this and it actually did diagnose my my spouse or you know it diagnosed me with some condition. And oftentimes it's things that are very systemic where a specialist would just refer you to another specialist who would refer you to another one. And so it seems like it's already starting to happen, but you know, lots of thinking to do around guardrails how do we bring physicians into the loop on this? Like, this is all so evolving. And, um, you know, I think it's exciting, but I have, again, I'm very cautious. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to stick with healthcare, uh, actually, for the duration of the show today. Um, let's talk about CRISPR. This is the gene editing technology uh, that, among other people, was pioneered by Dr. Jennifer Doudna. Uh, up at, at UC Berkeley. So after giving the green light to CRISPR's use to treat sickle cell disease in December, the FDA this week expanded its approval for another inherited blood disorder called TDT. So I want to know from you, Christina, how significant would you say this latest move by the FDA is for CRISPR? It's quite significant. From, from everything I've read, this actually came a lot sooner than was expected, because typically the FDA takes longer to make decisions like this. So it was a little bit shocking to biotech analysts that this happened so quickly. On the other hand, we've been talking about CRISPR for years, and we're still very much in the early, early innings when it comes to using CRISPR to really treat disease. And, you know, this is really exciting, I think, but we have many questions to answer around, around cost. There are also concerns that you know, we could inadvertently edit some kind of mutation that could lead to, to cancer in some of these patients. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I think it's really, like I said, I think, I think there's a lot of potential here. And this is probably where, you know, the direction that we'll take when it comes to treating disease. And I think the treatments that we have today just don't have this level of personalization. So it's, it's something that the biotech world rightly is, is investing in, but still mm -hmm. lots of unanswered questions. Let's stick with the theme of affordability, which you mentioned. Uh, when we had Dr. Doudna on the show a couple of months ago, I asked her about this, and she made it clear that that was top of mind for her. But these treatments for now could end up costing 3.5-ish million dollars. That is a lot of money. How do you think insurance companies look at an approval like this? They need to stay financially viable. You can throw some government programs into that mix as well, Medicaid, Medicare, for example. Do you think they'll be open to covering these kinds of treatments given the cost? So it's a, it's a great question, Lily. It's also a complicated question. You could argue that these diseases come with a lifetime cost of well more. You could say it costs $5 million, $6 million, and therefore you're actually saving money. But the problem is our system doesn't work that way. Um, when it comes to a lot of commercial insurance, the kind that you and I probably get um, as people who are employed, you know, we often leave jobs after three to five years, and therefore the insurance company really is only on the hook to pay for you for that long. So in my mind, this kind of only makes sense with a government insurer who might make that calculation around, okay, it makes sense to pay for a very expensive and potentially curative treatment. But a lot of insurance companies do not have a mindset around long-term health. And that, I would say, is one of the biggest shortcomings and failures of the American healthcare system. Yeah. And, and TDT, uh, this disorder that just got the approval for CRISPR, this is transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia. Um, this is a genetic disease that can cause symptoms like enlarged organs. It can delay puberty. The median age of death is 37. Um, another treatment option for this is stem cell transplants. And I wonder if you could just give me a quick you know, comparison. How does CRISPR compare to stem cell transplants, which are, again, an option but require donors? I mean, I'm thinking maybe it's easier to scale CRISPR treatments given that, that factor. Yeah, I think I think you're right there that, you know, stem cell, it do, that is a limitation. It does require finding a match. And oftentimes people just sit and wait for a very long time and they get more and more sick. 
And then it just becomes challenging to ultimately treat them, even if they do find a donor match. And so something like a CRISPR, I think, offers a solution that, you know, potentially could could treat somebody much sooner before the disease has has progressed. Um, but but then you face some of these same questions that that you and I talked about with affordability and are there any kind of downstream consequences of this treatment that we're not aware of yet because it's it's still so early. Yeah. Uh, well, folks can check out our interview with Dr. Doudna on our website, marketplacetech.org. Uh, and on to our third and final topic, is bad marketing stunting health tech companies? Chris, you've been writing about this in your newsletter, Second Opinion, it's called. And one of the you write that one of the common things holding back great ideas and products in digital health is consumer awareness. Tell me more. What are you saying? Yes, I. So I have a bit of a bone to pick with B two B marketing. It is so dry, so boring, and you see this across so many areas of technology. Um, it just it drives me nuts. I'm like, what this is, is businesses marketing to other businesses? Yes, yes, uh, marketing businesses trying to trying to approach. Um, in the case of healthcare, it would be a payer or it could be an employer, and this language that they use is just it's so <laughs> incredibly dry. Um, Agreed. Like, you know, terms like enablement and platform. What does this even mean? I hear platform and I think of a train. <laughs> so um, this, this, I think, is a big problem in the world of digital health because you are selling to these entities, but ultimately, you know, you you want to be used by a patient who might be an employee or a member of a plan. And that seems to be where a lot of these companies fail as they, you know, they get these big contracts, but then you look at the utilization and it's like, you know, maybe 1% of people who are eligible are even using these services. Yeah. And so I thought it was really exciting this past week when Amazon said they were going to partner with a company called Omada that is focused on um, mostly diabetes. And they, again, they sell to health plans, they sell to employers. And Amazon said, we'll, we'll show people through our own website who apply how to sign up to Omada. And, you know, from Amada's perspective, that's a very big deal because Amazon knows how to how to market to consumers. Like, who doesn't use Amazon? Um, so it could be a way for them to, to go from maybe, you know, double-digit utilization across some of their, their customers to, to far more than that. And I think Amazon will do that across a lot of healthcare companies. And so the idea is that if I buy, say, a medical device on Amazon, I might see a widget pop up that asks if I'm eligible for Omada services through my employer's health plan, for example. Um, and you talk about how there's a little bit of a creep factor to this. Um, how, how do you get the word out without weirding customers out or, or worse, violating their privacy? Yeah, it's a big problem. And I think I think for something like diabetes, so many people are pre-diabetic or diabetic. It's like one in three that, you know, you can kind of mass market some of these things and, and ultimately find a lot of your target kind of base. But then you look at kind of other companies that say specifically need to target LGBTQ employees. How do you do that? You know, how do you how do you find that subset that would use a service that is designed for, for them specifically, for them to get the right kind of healthcare treatment, how do you find those people without them telling you that information? And so oftentimes you get into this big problem on the B2B or enterprise marketing side where there's just no real way to find them. There's no real way to do it without coming across, across as creepy. Um, and I, I, I think it's a real factor that we need to take into account because, you know, a lot of people feel that they don't want their employers knowing personal information. I feel that way. So um, I think this, this offering from Amazon is a step in the right direction. Yeah. Well, folks can read all about it in your newsletter. Again, it's called Second Opinion. Chrissy Farr, it's so great to have you here. Thanks so much. Look forward to the next one. Definitely. That again was Chrissy Farr, an investor at Omer's Ventures. Rosie Hughes produced this episode. We thank all of you for watching today's show. I'm Lily Jamali. We will see you next week. This is APM.